Welcome everyone. This is lecture 11. This series of lecture is on fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base disorders. The lectures accompany and explain my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon. It's available as an ebook and also as a paperback. More information you can find in the description. We are still on chapter one, disorders of water balance, hyponatremia, and hypernatremia. Now we've reached the fun part. We've done explaining hyponatremia and hypernatremia, I would say in considerable detail. And now we are going to case studies in dysnatremias, and this is part one. Okay, let's get started. Case number one, post-operative hyponatremia. This is a 73-year-old man who underwent left hip open reduction and internal fixation after a fall at home. Post-operatively, he was started on D5W, 5% dextrose in water, at 100 ml per hour. On the third post-operative day, he became lethargic. A chemistry panel was obtained and revealed a creatinine of 1.4, sodium 124, potassium 3.3. What is the etiology of hyponatremia? This is, of course, is a true case. This is a very common scenario. I think this is probably the fifth time I say that uh, in this series. Administration of hypotonic intravenous fluids, in this case, dextrose in water, is the most common cause of hyponatremia in hospitalized patients. What did I do? We stopped the D5W, we gave the patient 0.9 isotonic saline, and we replaced potassium. Over the next three days, his serum sodium corrected from 124 to 134. So, in hospitalized patients, or post-operative patients in particular, use isotonic solutions, 0.9 normal saline or lactated ringer. Do not use hypotonic solutions unless the patient has hypernatremia. Case number two, this is hyponatremia and chronic hepatitis C. Here we have a 40-year-old woman with a known history of liver cirrhosis secondary to chronic hepatitis C infection. Um, I, I should say this case is uh, from uh, before we had very effective uh, treatment for hepatitis C. She presented with sodium-126, potassium-4.4, creatinine-1.2, serum osmolality-285, urine osmolality-500, urine sodium with 33, total protein-12, albumin-2.6. What is the etiology of her hyponatremia? Let's look closer at these labs. We can see that sodium is 126, that's good. Urine osmolality is high. Urine sodium is pretty high. Is this SIADH? Well, no. Look at serum osmolality, it is normal. Normal serum osm is 285 to 295 or 280 to 295. So this is a normal serum osmolality. With SIADH, you have what? Hypoosmolar hyponatremia. So this is not the case. So this is the first red flag. Now the second one is total protein. It's 12. It's very elevated. And albumin is low. So what's the etiology? Now for those of you who are taking tests, everything on the test has a meaning. Usually when... I give you a problem on hyponatremia. I don't mention total protein or albumin. So the fact that this information is there means something. So don't ignore it. On a test, usually we omit information that you don't need. So don't assume anything that isn't there. But if something is there, probably it has significance. It wasn't just put there for, for the sake of completion. So here we have two, not one, two red flags. The patient is isoosmolar, meaning the patient has normal osmolarity. And the patient has total protein that is elevated. So hyponatremia is not due to SIADH, 
because the patient is not hypoosmolar. Serum osmolality is normal. This is an example of pseudo-hyponatremia due to hypergammaglobulinemia due to hepatitis C. You can see hypergammaglobulinemia in hepatitis C occasionally, and this is one of the causes of pseudo-hyponatremia. Okay, on to case number three, hyponatremia and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here we have a 50-year-old man presenting with hyponatremia following subarachnoid hemorrhage. Sodium is 120. Serum osmolality is 255. Urine sodium is 82. Urine osm is 445. Blood pressure supine is 105 over 62, while sitting is 90 over 51. What is the etiology of hyponatremia? Let's concentrate a little bit. Urine sodium, is it low? Yes. So we have hyponatremia. Is it hypoosmolar? Yes. Serum osmolality is low. You can tell like 120 times 2, 240 plus something. So it's 255. That's close. Urine sodium is high and urine osmolality is, is pretty high. Is this SIADH? Well, SIADH, the patient is euvolemic. Is this patient euvolemic? No. Supine blood pressure is pretty low, but when the patient stood up, it dropped even lower. It's 90 over 51. So this patient seems to be dehydrated. Again, back to my first point. Why did I give you blood pressure to think about it? So it is relevant. Normally when we give a problem with hyponatremia, we don't give blood pressure measurements. So this means something. So both SIADH and cerebral salt wasting are associated with hypotonic, hypoosmolar hyponatremia. Both have high urine sodium and high urine osmolality. How do we tell them apart? Patients with SIADH are euvolemic by definition, while patients with cerebral salt wasting are, are volume depleted. This patient has orthostatic hypotension, and this is the, the cause, this is because he is volume depleted, and this hyponatremia is due to cerebral salt wasting following subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is not common, but you have to recognize it. And once you see a case, you'll never forget it, and you'll find yourself giving a lot of sodium, whether in the form of 0.9 saline or 3%, a lot of sodium. Let's go to case number four, hyponatremia and thiazides. 80-year-old woman who weighs 56 kilograms, so total body water would be what, about 28 liters. She is started on 25 milligrams of chlorothaladone daily for hypertension. Her initial electrolytes were normal. We said after starting a thiazide type diuretic, we should check electrolytes after what? one week, one month, and then every three months. So here, after a month, she presented to the emergency department with nausea and vomiting due to viral gastroenteritis. Her laboratory studies showed sodium, 118, low, potassium, very low, 2.3, serum osm, 253, so this is hypoosmolar hyponatremia. Urine sodium, not very high, 20 goes with someone on a thiazide diuretic. She's trying to reabsorb her sodium. Um, and now uh, urine potassium is, is 22. Uh, urine osmolality is 254. How would you manage her electrolyte disorder? Now, I, I should mention here that uh, many patients on the thiazide diuretics can have a little bit elevated urine sodium. In this case, it is low because this patient is particularly uh, dehydrated and she's trying to reabsorb sodium. So sodium is uh, variable. I wanted just to stress that. Now, this patient has both severe hyponatremia and hypokalemia due to the chlorothalidone, and then that was aggravated with viral gastroenteritis. Now, Administration of potassium chloride to correct potassium will raise her sodium the same way as giving sodium. And we mentioned that when we talked about hyponatremia. This patient was given four doses of KCL. Each one is 20 mil equivalents. And these K riders, these little bags of KCL, come in 100 ml of sodium chloride. 
okay? So 80 mil equivalents of KCL were given over eight hours, 10 mil equivalents per hour, which is a reasonable rate of correction. She was also started on 0.9 normal saline at 75 mL per hour. And therefore, the total volume infused was from the potassium chloride, we had 400 mLs. And from the uh, normal saline, we had 75 times 8, we had 1,000 mL. So over 8 hours, we've given 1 liter. So how do we determine the change in serum sodium? Well, this equation we mentioned when we talked about hyponatremia, the change in serum sodium equals the infusate, infusate meaning the fluid we're infusing. Infusate sodium plus infusate potassium minus current sodium divided by total body water plus one. What's the one? This is the liter we just gave because we increased total body water by one. So the infusate sodium is 154 because the saline has 154 mil equivalent per liter of sodium and the K riders we gave were also in saline. So it's 154. And then on top of that, we gave 80 of KCL and we add those up and my, uh, minus 118 and we get an answer of four, four mil equivalents per liter. So therefore the regimen we gave led to a rise in serum sodium of four over eight hours, which is very reasonable, very good. And then uh, maybe in the uh, remainder of the day, in the 16 hours, uh, we should raise sodium by another two to four and then we'll be, we'll be done for that day. Uh, sodium and potassium should be checked every four to six hours and then the rate of replacement is adjusted accordingly. So once we're done replacing the potassium, we'll check potassium. If the patient is a normal kalemic because we've given oral and we've given, we've given IV, then we don't need to replace potassium anymore and we'll continue to replace sodium. And we adjust the rate depending on what's going on. If potassium in this case was not taken into account and we did the calculations and we just put sodium, we conclude, we would erroneously conclude that sodium would rise by 1.2 and then it's possible that we would have given more 0.9 saline or even 3% and overcorrected the hyponatremia. So what's, what's the really, uh, the, the, the conclusion of this case? The conclusion is, when you have a patient with hyponatremia and hypokalemia both and you are replacing potassium, you should take that into account, add it to the equation the same way you add sodium. You add sodium and potassium together. I will stop here and we'll continue with these interesting cases in the following lecture.